Welcome to Micro, a podcast for short but powerful writing. I'm your host, Drew Hawkins. Bathtubs, Camaros, and under eye cream. Welcome to the season three finale of Micro, and can I just say what a wild and wonderful ride this season has been. In this episode, we have three pieces straight out of quotidian life on connection, a yearning for love, and loneliness. Like so many plans gone awry, our first piece bubbles up with good intent and then deflates in reality. Written by Dave Housley and published in Hobart, it's called Cialis. Enjoy. How did you even get these tubs out here, I ask. He squeezes my hand. It's a secret, he says. Happy anniversary. I reach across the space between our tubs and dip a fingertip into the soapy water, wiggle it toward his nether region. Is it working yet? He looks down. Can he really not tell without looking down? Getting older is full of surprises, almost none of them welcome. Not yet, he says. I rub a soapy hand across my thigh and look out over the lake. How he got the resort people to put these tubs out here, I have no idea. I know they weren't here yesterday when we had drinks at the fountain that stands maybe 30 yards to the right. I know they weren't here this afternoon when we had lunch on the restaurant's terrace. I know they were sitting on top of the lake's bank, steaming and soapy and ready to go, when we donned swimsuits and robes and headed down to what I thought was going to be the hot tub. It is lovely, though, the manicured lawn trailing down to the lakefront. Dark green water giving way in the distance to the mountains speckled with fall, and Ansel Adams morphing into a Jackson Pollock. A couple walks past us. They glance and look away. I sit up, hoping they can see the band of my swimsuit. For God's sake, William, I say. People think we're naked under here. But we're clearly wearing swimsuits, he says, shooting the last word out toward the fountain. The man nods his head and the woman giggles. I scrunch further down under my bubbles. This is lovely, he says. He looks at me and smiles. There are years on his face. History. But I can still see the glint in his eye, the mischievous smile, the confidence that made me wait for him in the hallway after freshman comp some 40 years ago. Now I know, of course, that confidence can be a funny thing. Confidence can mean timeshares and junk bonds, tech startups and subprime mortgages. Confidence can get you sitting out on the lawn of a five-star resort in a lukewarm tub waiting for an erection that may or may not arrive. My water is starting to get cold and my hands are wrinkling. We've been out here for an hour and I'm starting to wonder about logistics. How did they get hot water out here anyway, I say. Did people have to carry these things? Is this a normal thing that they do? Was it extra? Did you tip them? So many questions, he says. Can't you just appreciate this? Wouldn't one tub have been a little, you know, efficient, I say? I try to put a smile into my voice, a flirt. I like to think that I can still make that appendage rise without the help of pharmaceuticals. Maybe you could just appreciate the gesture, he says. He looks out over the lake and sighs. On the question of a single tub, may I remind you that I'm a partner? There's a certain, I mean, we couldn't just do it right here in the middle of the green briar. So on a practical level, I say... When that pill starts working, are we just going to walk to the room like nothing is happening? There are people playing shuffleboard over there. They're starting karaoke at the bar. He shakes his head, stares out over the lake. He wipes a hand on the side of the tub, picks up his phone. Mr. Romantic is checking his email, I say. Couldn't you just, he starts. A young couple walks over to the fountain. They are holding hands. The man puts his hand on the woman's leg and whispers in her ear. They giggle. He sits down and leans. she leans over onto his lap, looking up at the clouds. They look like they have all the time in the world. I think it's starting to work, he says. You think? Actually, he says, not yet. The sun is setting over the ridge and the sky purples. Karaoke sounds trickle down from the bar, a woman doing a capable version of my way. Should we have dinner brought in, I say? Or would you like to go to the restaurant again? My water has gone cold. Goosebumps are forming on my thighs. Hold on, he says. This will start working soon.
Dave Housley's third novel, The Other Ones, is out now from Allen Square Publishing. You can find him on Twitter at Housley Dave or on his website at HousleyDave.com. Our second piece could almost be an email from a husband to a wife, filled with everyday occurrence. And somehow, despite its specificity, Sean Ennis's piece, Nashing, published in Buffalo, 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 is quietly poignant. Enjoy. Grace. Let me know when you're ready to talk. I went to a poetry reading about crystal meth and depression last night while you were at Colleen's, and the only thing I could relate to was that it was in English. I'm clean. I'm happy. It's almost April, and it's like soldiers are marching home. You're teaching a friend to be more academic now, on your own time, which is nerdy as hell. Gabe has brought his grades up, all A's and B's. Wes, my protege, my lieutenant, has apologized using his non-university email account. I wanted to tell you that Gabe walked in on us last night when we were getting down to our business. Your back was to him and your eyes were closed, but I looked him right in the face. I wanted to tease him about it this morning, but got suddenly terrified he might say something hurtful and off-color. The birds are tweeting this morning, what the fuck was that about the storm last night? You suggested I try this cream below my eyes, not because of the gray bags there, but rather to experience its cold activation effect. I'm on to this, but we'll consider. Truthful, delicate suggestions are one of the advantages of marriage. I've applied it now. Minimal damage to Gabe, I'm sure, but it was the first night in a while I had trouble sleeping. Someone was tweeting about what makes for a good poem, so I suppose they know something. I disagreed in private, remembering the best that have been told often cut off three quarters of the way through with no satisfactory ending. The conversation turns left and happily. There are also the violent epics, those which we still talk about, or at least allude to. Be a dear and finish up with your work. I also want to tell you about the two young men who keep walking past the house, obviously casing it, obviously goofs, obviously trouble of some kind. These days, my love for you is so open and convenient, I could split their heads if they step foot on the driveway. These men in shorts in winter in our front yard, try me. But no, no, my mind is clear waters. I might at least gnash, but this duo are just lost kids, looking for love, jealous not of my TV, which is huge, but of the capital K kingdom. Sean Ennis is the author of Chase Us, Stories, from Little A. And more of his work can be found at seanennis.net and seanennis110 on Twitter. Fun fact about our third piece, Dave Eggers doesn't have a cell phone. So here he is reading his favorite short piece called Accident to me on the phone as I recorded him. Enjoy. Uh, this story is called Accident. You all get out of your cars. You are alone in yours, and there are three teenagers in theirs, an older Camaro in new condition. The accident was your fault, and you walk over to tell them this. Walking to their car, which you have ruined, it occurs to you that if the three teenagers are angry teenagers, this encounter could be very unpleasant. You pulled into an intersection, obstructing them, and their car hit yours. They have every right to be upset, or livid, or contemplating violence. As you approach, you see that their driver's side door won't open. 
the driver pushes against it, and you are reminded of scenes where drivers are stuck in submerged cars. Soon they all exit through the passenger side door and walk around the canal, inspecting the damage. None of them is hurt, but the car is wrecked. Just bought this today, the driver says. He is 18, blonde, average in all ways. Today, you ask? You are a bad person, you think. You also think, what a dorky car for a teenager to buy in 2005. Yeah, today, he says, and sighs. You tell them that you are sorry, that you are so, so sorry, that it was your fault and that you will cover all costs. You exchange in... <clears throat> You exchange insurance information, and you find yourself, minute by minute, ever more thankful that none of these teenagers has punched you or even made a remark about your being drunk, which you are not, or being stupid, which you are. You become more friendly with all of them, and you realize that you are much more connected to them, particularly to the driver, than possible in perhaps any other way. You have done him and his friends harm and you have jeopardized their health, and now you are so close you feel like you share a heart. He knows your name and you know his, and you almost killed a man because you got so close to doing so but didn't. You want to fall on him, weeping, because you are so lonely, so lonely always, and all contact is contact, and all contact makes us grateful. So grateful we want to cry and dance and cry and cry. In a moment of clarity, you finally understand why boxers who want so badly to hurt each other can rest their heads on the shoulders of their opponents, can lean against one another like tired lovers, so thankful for a moment of peace. Dave Eggers is an American writer, editor, and publisher. He wrote the best-selling memoir, A Heartbreaking Work of Staggering Genius. You can find him on his website at daveeggers.net. Well, folks, that wraps up our third season of Micro Podcast. Thanks to all of the artists who participated and to all of the micro crew, including Kirsten Renault, May May Kaufman, and Dylan Evers. If you'd like to hear more of our podcast before our next season, we invite you to listen to the rest of our catalog. A big thanks to the folks over at LitHub for hosting us on their website, and of course to our beloved listeners. We couldn't do this without you. We really appreciate it. Thank you so much. I'm Drew Hawkins, and I'll see you all next season. Thanks for listening. <laughs>